This is a bit of an unusual Sunday for us this morning. This is our Missions Sunday, and we'll give special emphasis this morning to uh, our friends laboring in Papua New Guinea. It was not very long ago that a group of islands was populated by tribes of savage peoples, a collection of warring peoples boasting an armed force of half a million half-naked warriors bedecked in blue body paint. They practiced human sacrifice, cannibalism, witchcraft, and sorcery. They built altars to an array of gods, and they were merciless toward their enemies. Those islands are situated in the North Atlantic. They are the British Isles. Today, most of you are reading from an English Bible. How did that happen? What I want to do for us this morning in just thinking about missions is think about three texts that sort of lead us to an answer to the question of how do we get from tribes of savage cannibals to gospel-believing, Bible-reading missionaries? I want you to turn first to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. This, of course, is a familiar passage and the basis for thoughts on Missions. It has been called the Great Commission. Jesus, before his ascension, told his disciples these words. We'll read together in Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. A really remarkable commission given to the 11 who were gathered there, not a task they themselves could complete, but by making disciples could complete. Because the 11 would make disciples who would make disciples who would make disciples who would make disciples to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the age. And we've looked at this text before. You know that the main idea is making disciples. And the imperative there follows through in all the other descriptors, going, baptizing, teaching them. In short, a disciple-making disciple was to see others come to know Jesus Christ to be taught in New Testament doctrine, embedded in the idea of teaching them all that I commanded you is the whole organism of the church that Jesus would institute, uh, that he would train and equip and build up as the engine for this very task to the ends of the age. And it concludes with the promise of Jesus' own special presence in this impossible endeavor to make disciples of all the nations. That is the Great Commission I want to fast forward in time and history to Revelation chapter 5. I want us to catch a glimpse of the throne room in heaven where we see concentric circles of worshipers surrounding the throne. This is that great scene where John the apostle is weeping in this vision because no one is able to open the book of the seals. And what is that book of the seals? It is the unfolding judgment of God's wrath against earth dwellers. And nobody is worthy to usher in God's future plan of judgment against rebellious earth. No angel, no human, none of the living creatures assembled there. Only one person is able to open this scroll to break its seals and effectively to usher in God's future history. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation 5, he is called the Lion of Judah. And when John turns to see him, he is a lamb standing as if slain, still bearing the marks of his crosswork, and yet he the one who will judge. And all eyes are on him in this great scene. Angels and the four living creatures and the myriads of worshipers surrounding him. And in verse 9... The text says, they sang a new song, saying, worthy are you, speaking of Jesus the Christ, to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain, 
and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Jesus, in his first coming, purchased by his own blood people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people that here in this scene, this throne room of heaven, surround Jesus the Christ in worship and adoration and they sing this song. What does that tell us about Matthew 28 and the Great Commission? It will be successful. If you are involved in Jesus' task of disciple-making, of making disciples who make disciples who make disciples of all the nations to the end of the age, based on Jesus' commission and with the authority that Jesus was given from all heaven and with the promise of Jesus' presence. If you involve yourself in that task, you must know you are involved in the most successful endeavor that has ever been enacted. Because those people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people surround the throne. This look into the future is literal history. It is literal future history. It's as good as done. And how do we get from Matthew 28 to Revelation 5? How do we go from the Great Commission and those 11 disciples to a throng of worshipers from every tongue and tribe and nation and people? I want to turn your attention to Romans chapter 10. I believe this is the means by which God gets us in this age from Matthew 28 to Revelation chapter 5. In Romans chapter 10, there is a remarkable thing happening in this verse. Paul, the apostle, Paul the Jew, Paul the one who has been humbled by Christ, Paul who saw his former life as rubbish in his coming to Jesus Christ, is speaking about the problem of Israel. Why Israel, who was the bringer about of Messiah in terms of human lineage, why have they rejected their own Messiah? Why are they in overwhelming unbelief of the gospel? Why have they effectively rejected the word of God? Paul is unfolding that problem here as Gentiles are believing in Israel's Messiah en masse. And Paul is weeping over the state of apostate Israel. And in Romans 9, 10, 11, Paul is unfolding God's remarkable plan of grace to the undeserving. That plan which will demonstrate to Jews who one day believe that they never deserved to be in the gospel. They never deserved to be in God's favor, but are only there by God's grace and his kindness as they believe. And to Gentiles who historically were outsiders have been brought in by God's grace so that Jew and Gentile alike for all of eternity will say, what am I doing here? Only God's kindness has brought me to him. And unfolding all of that plan, Paul reiterating for us the hardness of Israel and the inclusion of the Gentiles gives us a little window into how God is bringing about this promise to make disciples of all the nations. And notice what he says in verse 11. The scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. What a remarkable promise. And we must must pause and ask, saved from what? (laughs) Ultimately, saved from God. Saved from God. We need to be saved from sin. We need to be saved from ourselves. We need to be saved from the culture of this world and from satanic blindness. But ultimately, we must be saved from God and his wrath that is due our sin. And the only way any sinner is ever saved from God's wrath is by God himself. God's provision of his grace and love and kindness and forgiveness through the one and only Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And whoever will call on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. Verse 14 says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Do you understand? In order to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to believe him. You have to believe him at his word. And verse 14 says, How will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? You can't believe in Jesus Christ if you haven't heard of him. And how will they hear without a preacher, a proclaimer, someone to speak the truth of Christ? And verse 15, how will they preach unless they are sent? And this reflects what Jesus said in the Great Commission. Make disciples going. You can't make disciples of all the nations if there's not a going imperative along with it. And so there are those who must go and proclaim and must be sent. Listen to this remarkable statement in verse 15. Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Do you remember those who brought you the gospel? Do you remember the good news of Jesus Christ? Maybe the first time you heard it and the means by which God brought it. Maybe a Bible translated in your own language. Maybe a proclaimer. It may have been a preacher, a sermon. It may have been a friend. It may have been a parent. But how beautiful are those feet of those who bring good news. Paul goes on to talk about the hardness of Israel and how not everybody believes. There are hard hearts. But the way that people get from Matthew 28 to Revelation 5 is right here through Romans 10. God uses means to bring people to himself. That means we give the label missions. We give the label missions. And if you've ever uh, done a Bible study of the word missions or missionary or mission trip or mission agency, you may have come to the stark realization that those words aren't in your Bible. Uh, even labels like Paul's third missionary journey is a, a heading, a label over paragraphs, but it's not in the biblical text. And we're okay to use the word missions as long as we describe the enterprise of the expansion of the local church in the disciple-making process with the gospel of Jesus Christ for the glory of God on biblical terms. You know that there is a lot in the world today that's called missions that we wouldn't call missions. And so at Grace Bible Church, we boiled down this idea of missions to four words. Glory, gospel, church, world. That is the glory of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The substitutionary, atoning death of Jesus Christ in the place of sinners. The glory of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ manifested in the church so often missions today leaves the church behind. In fact, as a missions major, I was taught church is what you do here in America, missions is what you do over there. An unbiblical notion. The reality is we are as far from Israel or from uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Tempe. We're about as far away from where the church began as you can get on the globe. And the reason we're here is because God uses the church to accomplish his purposes. And so where the church does not exist, the church must exist. We call that missions. The glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ manifested in the church around the world. You see, the Matthew 28 process is not done if we all stay here. Because there are tribes and tongues and peoples and nations who do not yet have the gospel, who do not yet benefit from the local church, who do not yet have the word of God in their own language. And so we love missions. Missions is important to us at Grace Bible Church, we believe, because it is important to God. And missions is near and dear to our hearts at Grace Bible Church because as a body, we have effectively cut off our right arm and our left leg and sent it to the other side of the world. And we miss them. The missionaries that we have sent from this church are every bit a part of this body and they are doing the things that the rest of us are not doing in difficult places and difficult times for this very task that God loves. And we feel it acutely, those empty seats are Massimo and Susanna and the Mitchells and Amelia and the Cams. You know that Grace Bible Church supports a a number of missionaries. We support Wayman Lee, who is with Training Leaders International, 
and he has a very strategic ministry on almost every continent. I don't think, Wayman, you've done a pastor's conference in Antarctica, uh, but nearly every continent, uh, Wayman has been involved in training pastors to pastor local churches in those places. And one of our pastors, Ashley Anderson, has been on a number of trips training pastors at the seminary level. You know, Massimo was here recently. The Malika family is church planting in Italy. And this morning, we're giving an extended focus on our missionaries in Papua New Guinea. It was about a dozen years ago that I read a letter to our church from a Doe tribesman, N-D-O, Doe. One of the tribes in the mountains, the Finister Mountains of Papua New Guinea. And Joey Tartaglia had given us this letter. And when, when Joey got the letter, the sentiment was old. Uh, when Joey brought it to us, it was dated, and when I read it to this church, it was even older still. And the letter read, we are waiting for a workman, a missionary, to bring God's word in our own language, in our talk place. And we talked to you a while ago about doing this, and we are still waiting. And I held up this letter in front of this church and, and said, does anybody want to do this? And a software engineer, and a tradesman, and a high school teacher, and their sweet families signed up and said, yes, we want to do that. Uh, when do we buy our plane tickets? Uh, first, we're going to learn Hebrew, and Greek, and systematic theology, and church history, and pastoral ministry, and all the rest. And you know the story. And they trained for years, over half a decade. And they've made their way to Papua New Guinea. You'll get to hear more of that story in just a moment. And you as a church were involved in their training in a very strategic and significant way by being a healthy biblical New Testament church as a model and a template for what the church must be whenever it is planted. And you as a body sacrificed and gave. You prayed and you gave financially and you gave of things. You sent boxes to the other side of the world. And most painfully, you sent your dear friends, the Cans, the Dodds, the Laymans. The New Testament local church is a body and we feel it when one member of the body hurts. How did we feel it when those seats emptied? And they went so far away. You've funded them. You've prayed for them. You've supported them. Many of you have been part of missionary support teams. They left in 2014. And this morning, we get to hear a little bit about how they are doing. Uh, a while ago, we did a live update. They're 17 hours ahead, so it's, uh, it's dark. It's already Monday in Papua New Guinea. Uh, it's a little bit hard to make sure the technology works. So uh, just for clarity's sake, this is a pre-recorded message uh, from our families in Papua New Guinea. And uh, if we can roll that video update, that'd be great. Thank you. The Cans, the Dodds, and the Laymans moved to Papua New Guinea in 2014. Uh, we got the work started here, and then later on, the Mitchell family and Amelia moved in to replace the Dodds when they had to go back to the States. We've been here for uh, over half a decade now, uh, working to plant a church here in the mountains of Papua New Guinea. In Papua New Guinea, because of the rugged landscape, there are many, many tribes and over 800 tribal languages we desire to go to one of these tribes and learn their language and culture and then teach them the gospel in their heart language. When we first moved to Papua New Guinea, uh, we moved to the town of Madang and we spent some time learning the local trade language, Melanesian Pidgin. Uh, we spent some time getting used to PNG culture, spending time in language sessions, going on public transport, going to the local market, and just finding our way around some basic PNG culture. So from when we arrive in the city of Medang, within the province of Medang, it's very much a bridge to our work in the village here in the Rikos Mountains. We are initiated into the Papua New Guinea culture and as Amelia has mentioned, we spend most of our time there specifically trying to learn the language Melanesian Pidgin. 
thankfully, Melanesian Pidgin is very easy to learn relative to the language we have to learn here in the village. But without it, we could not come here and communicate well and start learning the Do language. Once we felt ready, we chose the language group Do. We built houses and we transitioned into the village. Our village is called Maoiredo. There are many other Do speaking villages in the surrounding mountains. And when, Lord willing, there are believers here, we want to train them to bring the gospel to those other Do speaking villages and then beyond. After moving into the village, we had to transition from learning the trade language, Melanesian Pidgin, to learning the Do language. And the Do language is much harder. It doesn't have any English words in it. The grammar is complex. And even the way they think about things is very different. So we not only had to learn how they speak, but we had to learn how they live and how they perceive the world around them. After about three years of learning uh, their language and their culture, we transitioned into teaching them how to read and to write in their own language. There are some people here who can read and write basic things in Pidgin, but no one here has ever learned to read or write in Do because there was no written language. So we created a Do alphabet, some basic reading books, and a literacy program to teach people here how to read and write in Do. We must teach the people here to read God's word in order that they can, that they can read it for themselves. Uh, if they rely solely on the missionaries to teach them God's word, they'll never be able to study it for themselves and to learn truth by themselves and to learn new truths and continue to grow spiritually. They'll always be dependent on other people to teach them God's word. And that's why it's essential for us to establish a good literacy program and to teach the people to read. The very first Do literacy class began in October 2019 and completed in January this year. And that was taught by Cassidy and Amelia and I helped her just with marking books and helping with reading. The second class just finished and that was almost taught in its entirety by a graduate of the first class, Micah Bay. So going through a four month literacy program to start learning to read your own language and write your own language is not enough to prepare you to read and study the Bible with any real meaning. Therefore, we started, Alna, myself, and Amelia working together, started a post-literacy program. Post-literacy really is an ongoing program where the students who have finished the literacy program come in and practice reading. Practice, 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 that's all we do. And we work through several levels, starting with very easy readers, working all the way up to more technical concepts like what was life like in ancient Israel or where did cars and choppers and planes come from. This is essential. It's yet another bridge for us to get to the gospel teaching. When Zach starts preaching the gospel, we need people to be able to read his lessons. We need them to be able to read the scripture portions and to do so with meaning and emphasis and be able to understand what they're reading and answer questions and anything like that that may arise during teaching. So post-literacy is a critical stage that follows from literacy and ultimately it itself becomes a bridge to further literacy in Scripture. After six years, we have finally reached the climax of our ministry. As my fellow teammates have been finishing up their culture and language studies, I have been translating uh, the scripture for the last year. Uh, we've translated portions from uh, Genesis all the way through to Revelation, and now we're putting together lessons to help explain the story of the Bible from beginning to end. I'm nearing the end of it, and Lord willing, on November 1st, we will begin lessons, uh, starting in Genesis with the creation of the world and the God who made all things, uh, moving them through the story of the fall, why there's problems and why there's pain and suffering in the world, and why, uh, what is it that has made people sinful by nature. And we're going to move them all the way through to the good news about Jesus, how God loved the world and sent his son to die so that whoever believes in him can actually have a relationship restored with God and live with him forever and have eternal life.
if we shared about Jesus and Melanesian pigeon when we just arrived, there would have been a problem. Uh, primarily because there is a lot of people who do not know Tokpisin really well uh, or do not know Tokpisin at all. And the other thing is we really had to learn the culture in order to communicate Christ very clearly to the people here. For example, uh, the people here rely very hard on give and take relationships. That is fundament fundamental to how their relationships here uh, work. And if they think God is like man and man is like God, what can happen here is what happened in the previous village as well. They can think that if they serve God long enough, they pay back the debt that they owe God and God will be indebted to them and then they will earn and deserve their salvation. We approach language learning in different stages. We start with just basic vocabulary, um, things like what are houses made of, what is a post called, what is a floor called, and what are different foods called. And then as we um, learn that, we start asking cultural questions like how do you build the house, how do you cook the food? And as we then progress in language learning to more complex grammar, we start learning more of the culture too and we start asking more complex questions like um, who is free to marry whom, how do marriages work, um, how does financial things in the culture work. And as we live among the people, we're also having informal com conversations with them and learning more about the culture just through observing them and living amongst them. And as we approach the deeper stages of culture, we're also learning more about the language and we can ask these harder questions. Every week and every month that we're here, we're seeing and hearing and processing more information about the Doe people, what they think and what they believe. And now, by God's grace, we're close to the time we'll be able to clearly communicate the gospel to them in the Doe language. It's taken about 12 years, starting with meetings, with prayer, with guidance, with raising teammates, raising support. Eventually, us South Africans joining the team in 2016, more prayer, more travel, more support, more training to bring this entire team to this point where in November, Zach will be able to give God's talk here in the village of Mauarero. We want to thank you as a team for all these years of love, of support, of prayer, of generous, generous giving towards this ministry. And we would ask you to continue your prayer and support towards us and pray especially uh, for our people here in the village of Mauarero. Without you holding the rope, none of this would be possible. And so in Christ, we want to thank you and know that we too pray for you guys and love you very much. My name is Calista Mitchell and I live in Marrero and I am 12 years old and I'm starting sixth grade. And one of my favorite things about living in Marrero is my pets Nacho, Snowflake and Jasmine. My name is Sebastian Mitchell. I live Live in Marrero. I'm nine years old and I'm starting fifth grade. My favorite thing about living here is my bow and arrow. Hi, my name is Jean Kerr and I'm eight years old and I'm in third grade and I like Marrero uh, because I get to hike the remote river and the waterfall. My name's Oliver Canton, and, uh, and I like going on hikes, and, and I'm six years old. My grade is, and I'm first grade, and, and I live in Papua New Guinea. What a blessing, yes. Um, it really is true that uh, 12 years of, of labor and prayer and effort uh, is coming to a culmination. I'm going to spend just a few minutes sharing with you three things about uh, the team in Marrero, uh, just so that you can understand a little bit more about what they're doing and, and where they are right now. 
Um, you got a lot of it from the video, but I, I hope to expand on it a little bit more so that you will know how you can be praying for them, especially in the coming weeks. Uh, first, I'm going to share with you some challenges related to bringing the gospel to these people. And you heard some of that already, but hopefully I can expand on that. Um, the first is that the Doe language, uh, up until the last year or so, was not a written language. And that means that the language itself uh, was not actually read. And it didn't have an alphabet. And so uh, the ones who developed the alphabet were the ones who were learning the alphabet itself and learning the language itself. So the missionaries uh, had to know the language well enough to understand all of the sounds that were being made in the language. And they came up with a set of alphabet and a set of letters that could describe all of those sounds. But part of this is that the um, language itself not being written is that the people themselves are not a reading people. Reading is just not part of their culture. Uh, as Cassidy shared, a few of the people in the village actually know and understand the Melanesian pidgin language uh, well enough to read it, and they can read it, but uh, nobody actually knows how to read the Doe language. And so reading is just not a part of their culture. And the reason why that's important for us today is because uh, God's word is the standard for what is true. Uh, they shared a little bit about it in the video, but what's important is not to take only the word of the missionary. They actually need the word of God themselves. And the only way you can actually know the truth of God is to read the truth in his word. So um, please be praying for them. Be praying for those who have finished the literacy class and that are on ongoing with the post-literacy program, that more and more people in the village will know how to read. They will learn how to read their own language so that uh, when the scriptures are completed, they will know how to read the scriptures and read God's truth for themselves. So that's the first thing that is really kind of a challenge in, as it relates to sharing the gospel and bringing the gospel to them. Another challenge that, that Zach has shared with me over the years is uh, the people in the village have a very different view of world history than we do. Uh, in their culture, uh, things don't go back much farther than four or five generations. Uh, everything more than four or five generations back is just kind of in this flat space of time, and it's all sort of the same. And so that's kind of hard for them because uh, the message that they're going to be teaching in these Bible lessons that, that Zach mentioned, uh, they start with uh, the creation 6,500 years ago, and they work through for the next 4,000 or so years from Adam to Noah and to Moses and up through David and to Jesus and into the church age. And uh, they just don't have a context for thousands and thousands and thousands of years that ended 2,000 years ago when the church age uh, began. And so that's hard for them to comprehend because they don't really have um, a history of doing that. They don't really have a way of thinking of that themselves. And, and so please be praying for, for them as well, that the Lord would open their mind to understand uh, the timeline of history of this world so that they can understand where scripture fits in it and how the gospel fits and that the Savior lived and he died and that he is coming again. So be praying for that as well. And the third thing that is a challenge, uh, among other things, that I want to mention to you, and you heard about it in the, uh, the video, is that there is a false gospel that has been present in that area in the Finister Mountains for a number of decades now, several decades. And as they've shared, as you heard, it's a gospel that, uh, that views that um, it's a very man-centered view of the gospel. It's a gospel that says that God is appeased by man's efforts to make himself acceptable before God. And uh, what we need to be doing here is praying for the people of Mararoro, that God would open their eyes to see that the message that they are hearing from Zach and Cassidy and Ryan and Elna and Amelia is the one and the only gospel message that can be believed for salvation. So we want to be praying for that. I want to take a few minutes just to tell you a little bit more about these chronological Bible lessons that Zach has developed he has put together a series of 50 lessons, 50 lessons that, that encapsulate the message of Scripture, starting with Genesis 1 and ending in Revelation 21 and 22. It explains the creation of the universe, which is going to be new for them. It explains the fall. It explains how man fell out of grace with God. It explains um, God's choice of the nation Israel, his raising up of Israel and raising up a people group from which he will bring forth the Messiah that will save and that is going to come again. And he's going to put together these 50 lessons and teach these 50 lessons, one lesson per day for 50 days. He's going to teach five lessons per week. 
And he's going to start in the first week in November, as you heard. And the activity here is that hopefully as many people as possible in the village are going to come together and hear this long explanation of the gospel for 50 days. And so what I want to ask everybody here to be doing is to be praying regularly, starting at the 1st of November into January, for the progress of the gospel in this village. This is what we've been aiming at, what we've been shooting at for the last dozen years, uh, to raise up a team, to fund a team, to send a team, learn the Melanesian pidgin language, and then to learn the tribal language so that they can preach the language to these people in their own heart language. So that's what we want to be praying for. That's what they're doing. Uh, Zach is going to be preaching that. They've got a special place in the village set aside where they're going to be doing that. And uh, we just pray that God will use the speaking of the message, as Smed shared from Romans 10, so that in hearing, you can hear the word of Christ, and in that, you can believe. Last thing I want to share with you is how we are ongoing supporting them here. Obviously, we have a financial support, and people throughout the church are praying for them. Uh, but Smed mentioned the missionary support teams. He mentioned an MST. An MST is designed to support those who are actually on the field. And we meet once a month. Uh, I'm part of the, the CAN missionary support team. We meet once a month, and uh, we gather together, and we discuss the needs that the CANs have in the village of Marrero. And uh, we discuss how it is that we can meet their needs from here. And we pray for them. We pray for the gospel and its success there. And uh, we communicate with the, the CANs. We call them. We text them. We email them. We keep in touch with them. Um, it's a really good way. They're really encouraged when the body is reaching out to them like that. And so um, I would encourage you to be praying about how you can be involved in a missionary support team. If you'd like to be involved with the CAN MST, uh, just contact me and let me know. Uh, we will probably be putting together another MST for the, the logistics coordinator position that Smed's going to tell us a little bit more about uh, that's going to be heading up in uh, PNG next year. But give that some thought. Give that some prayer. Uh, they are always encouraged when more people are contacting them and encouraging them and praying for them. All right, so Smed is going to finish up our service by giving us the rest of the talk on PNG. Thank you, Scott. I want to give you a little bit of an update on uh, a couple of families, the Laymans and the Tartaglias in particular. Um, so the second row there was empty for a while. The Laymans have come back. You know that Jeremy just started at the Expositor Seminary this fall semester, and uh, we're really glad to have you guys back. And Jeremy served four years as the logistics coordinator, so that was the role in Medang and the port city that helped give support to the teams up in the tribal areas in the mountains. Such a critical role, and Jeremy lived out what it means to be a servant in that role and really laid the groundwork for it, invented the role, and uh, is uh, laboring to pass that baton on to others. And so uh, Craig Noyes, who is part of a second team in Papua New Guinea with Finisterre Vision, um, is carrying that currently, but team two is trying really hard to allocate to another tribe. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how we want to fill that logistics coordinator position. Uh, Jeremy has come back to um, really begin another role with Finisterre Vision. Uh, that's the organization that um, we work with in Papua New Guinea. And uh, that role is business manager. And this is a role that uh, we've desperately needed that Jeremy is fulfilling here. And I want to tell you a little bit about what he's doing. We actually call him the ICBM, the Intercontinental Business Manager. And uh, he's in charge of finance for the organization, legal uh, matters for the organization, IT and web development and then overseeing the logistics coordinator position, as well as being involved back here in training for future missionaries and missionary teams to go to Papua New Guinea. And so these are really, really critical roles for us. Jeremy is still a supported missionary with Finisterre Vision. So if you're giving to the layman's, I want to encourage you to continue to do that. Uh, and that is a family that you can give uh, to if you have resources and would like to give. And uh, really, the, the organization... Um, needs this role. It's such a critical support role here in the States. I want to tell you a little bit about Joey Tartaglia. And Joey and Brooke, uh, if you guys could stand up for us. We, we love you guys. Um, Joey, as you know, uh, served a number of years with another tribe uh, in the Finister Mountains of Papua New Guinea, the Mibu people, and went through the same process you just heard about in the video. 
and got to see the people hear the gospel for the first time in their own language through the chronological Bible teaching. They got to see the church birthed. That church in Mibu now has uh, multiplied and is seeing the gospel go to neighboring tribes that they are able to reach out to in uh, languages that are close enough uh, that they can take the gospel message faithfully to. Uh, you need to know that there are still 50 tribes in the Finisterre Mountains, just that little peninsula in Papua New Guinea, that still have no gospel, no church, no Bible. 50 more tribes. And if you see people with their water bottles floating around with a little 50 left sticker, that's what that sticker is all about. And, and, and there's a little emblem there with a mountain and a, a Bible. Right, the Bible underneath the Finisterre Mountains. And, and the countdown is on, 50 left. That is 50 separate language-speaking tribes that need the gospel, need the church, and need the Bible in their own language. Now, we believe that that task can be accomplished in the Finisterre Mountains if nine or so more teams can go to the Finisterre Mountains. Nine or so, nine or so more teams Bible translation, church planting teams. And so that's a, that's a way that you can pray for Finister Vision as an organization. Uh, maybe it's what you want to do when you grow up. Uh, you can be praying toward that end and considering those things. Joey and Brooke are back here. They're members of Grace Bible Church. They're supported, mem- uh, supported missionaries of Grace Bible Church. And, and they have some significant needs as well. We'd like to invite you to consider giving to Joey's role as executive director of Finister Vision. And Joey's tasks are many. I'll summarize it just by saying he is a, a recruiter for the organization, trying to raise up more teams to go to the Finister Mountains. Uh, he is also kind of the glue that holds so many things together. Um, he is involved in training future missionaries. And right now, currently, Joey is the backstop for that logistics role that's open right now. And so for team two to get to the mountains, we need somebody to be in Medang uh, operating the logistics role. And Joey, as the executive director, is going to be filling that role unless, unless we find a logistics coordinator in time to get team two up to the mountains. Um, currently, uh, there are, coronavirus has affected the whole world. It's affected mission agencies getting into Papua New Guinea like other things. And so lots of things are unpredictable. But what we do know is that logistics role is really critical to the organization. It's a lifeline for the Cans, the Mitchells, for Amelia. And it's just critical that they are able to get their groceries, have medical evacuations should they need it, and we've used that in the past. Um, as well as a person in country to deal with uh, government issues and basically everything logistical. And so we, we really need someone to fulfill that role in a near-term basis, and we'd love to have somebody who could fulfill that role in a long-term basis. And in the meantime, Joey is a Band-Aid. No offense, Joey, but you're a Band-Aid. <laughs> And Joey loves being a Band-Aid, but we really would love for Joey to fulfill his role as executive director and not have to do that. So pray with us along those lines. If you would like to give to the Laymans or to the Tartaglias, or if you would like to give specifically to the logistics coordinator role, I would like to invite you to visit the website, finisterevision.org, and you can get there from our own church website to find out more. Let me give you just a couple of prayer needs Um, Please pray for the health of our teams. Health everywhere is precarious. Uh, Health in Papua New Guinea is particularly precarious. We would love for coronavirus not to make its way into the village. Um, But recently, Ryan had a bout of malaria. Was it malaria? Did we confirm that? Um, And it just makes life difficult. You can't get get the kind of medical care that you and I have access to regularly. And so just pray for them. And pray for the chronological Bible teaching beginning next month. Scott already implored all of us to do that. If I could just plead with us as a body to make it a regular habit of concentrated prayer, particularly November through January, as our team is teaching through the Bible. Uh, We know that our enemy, uh, the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they do not see the glory of God in the face of Christ 
We know that the Doe people naturally are at enmity with God. And we know that there are insurmountable barriers to people in a tribe in the mountains of Papua New Guinea actually believing the gospel. But our God is the one who has crossed those insurmountable barriers in our own hearts and our own lives to bring us the gospel. And has even guaranteed with the precious blood of his own son that people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people would have those barriers broken down. So pray with us. Let's pray as a church and let's pray for this team in this critical time. Again, pray for a logistics coordinator. Pray for more teams. Um, There is so much to ask God for. We recognize that these are impossible things. And yet God is the one who regularly does the impossible anytime he he brings a sinner to himself through Christ. Will you pray with me even now? Heavenly Father, we just give you praise that you are a God of grace. You look at us in our dire need. When we were at our worst, you loved us through Christ. We were your enemies and Christ died for us. We thank you for the church. We thank you for the institution that you have endowed with all that it needs to accomplish this great commission. And we pray that the church would extend to places it is not yet known. We thank you for your word in our own language. We so often take for granted. We pray that it would find a home in other languages where it is not yet heard. God, we pray that you would protect this team, our precious friends, uh, the parts of this body that have been removed from us physically to go after this task, which is so critical. We pray that you would equip them for everything that lies ahead. We pray that you would comfort them in their isolation. We pray that you would protect their health and give them all that they need to faithfully teach your word. We pray for the Doe people. God, that you would be pleased to birth a Doe church, that that church itself would grow and mature to the fullness of the stature of Christ, that it would be equipped by you with pastors and teachers, that it would multiply, and that you would use a Doe church to bring other tribes in the Finister regions and beyond to yourself through the gospel. And God, we lay our own lives before you even this week as we think about leaving this room, this place, to go to our various places of occupation and residence. God, we pray that you would use us as those who have been confronted by your holiness and have been comforted by your grace in the gospel, that you would use us to do the impossible, to draw people to yourself, to raise the dead, to make disciples. We ask it all for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.